Our guest tonight became a cult hero of the Melbourne Football Club despite playing fewer than 100 games in a career that spanned five years from 1987 to 1991. His firebrand style matched his shock of red hair and endeared him to a generation of D's fans. We're talking about the one and only Straubs, the great Stephen O'Dwyer. Welcome to the Demonland Podcast, Straubs. Thanks, Andrew. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Straubs, Mason Cox gets a lot of love these days, having come over from America, but you did something similar more than 30 years ago because you spent a number of uh, your formative years in the US due to your father's work. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I went over there as a... As a young teenager, my dad was working for the embassy in DC, so was over there for about four years. And whilst over there, I was playing gridiron and baseball and basketball, and because I just loved sport as a kid. And came to Melbourne, started playing footy around 16, 17, uh, because that's what they played in Melbourne was <laughs> AFL and cricket. So I took that up. Uh, in addition to, to those sports, Straubs, it's true that you're also a bit of a gun at rugby, we believe, having spent some of your childhood in uh, in New South Wales, obviously. New South Wales, yeah, played union as, <laughs> as a kid. So that was kind of my formative years and then went into the gridiron and then into, uh, into AFL. Uh, Straubs, if we can take you back to your very first game, it was round four, 1987. You gave St Kilda's Allen side bottom an absolute bath. You also managed to get yourself suspended for striking for the first time. Uh, it kind of set the scene for the rest of your career, didn't it? Uh, always in good form, but never far from the umpire's notebook. Uh, it was probably a bit unfortunate uh, getting suspended in your first game because you do get a bit of a reputation with the umpires. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd played one game and been suspended for two when I came back um, and didn't really start off on the right foot. I uh, got suspended again on the first game back and got another two weeks. Uh, that, that was uh, definitely meant that I had to be very, very careful. Um, I never got suspended as a junior or reported even, um, but once back in those days you had to stand up for yourself, otherwise you just got crucified. Uh, Straub's your most famous and probably most costly suspension came in that preliminary final against Carlton in 1988. Uh, tell us a bit about that incident and did you realise at the time that it was going to cost you a spot should we make it the following week? Um, well, I can remember the incident. It was uh, Steve Guru, he was going for the ball and I came in to tackle him off the ball and he kind of put his foot out and went low and I got him a little bit high with like a, my, my, really my bicep, I guess. Um, so then, you know, about three or four Carlton players jumped on top of me and gave me, <laughs> gave me a bit of a hiding. And I came up and the umpire was there and he took my number and at that stage I knew that I'd be in uh, serious strife because every time I took my number, I didn't really uh, get much of a hearing. Um, so, yeah, at that stage, I was a bit worried and thought that it might be okay. A lot of people have done less than that before a grand final and not got suspended. So, but unfortunately, uh, we went to the tribunal the night before the Brownlow, or night of the Brownlow, and... Uh, got suspended for two weeks. I uh, went to the Brownlow with the teammates and they were all on the orange juice and so I decided that I <laughs> might have a couple of years to drown the sorrows. How, how hard was it sitting on the sidelines that day watching as we got thumped, knowing you couldn't do anything about it? Oh, it was horrendous. Uh, I, I can remember watching the game and just... Every time the ball bounced, it bounced in the, into the arms of the Hawthorne players and seemed like nothing could go right for us that day. Um, and then going out on the ground afterwards when, uh, as you said, being thumped and on record margin yeah. at that stage. Um, yeah, it, uh, I felt for all of them and also felt for them because I felt that I'd let them down a little bit. Uh, Straubs, you ranked eighth. Uh, in most reports, and ninth in terms of most games uh, missed. Uh, was there a bit of white line fever 
about the way you played that game and had you always had that in you uh, in the sport that you played? Um, always been competitive. Um, so if that's what you call white line fever, then I'd say, yeah, yep. definitely. I'm, you know, you get on the field and you want to win. Uh, also, what I said before, in that uh, it was pretty tough in those days and you come in as a, you know, 18 year old kid and you're playing against the likes of well Mark Lee was my first night game that I played and you know sent him, uh, they'd kick out the ball from a point and uh, he'd stomp on your foot and give you an elbow in the head and then run off and take a mark so <laughs> it really was uh, a totally different game back in those days and one of also having to stand up for your smaller players as well because uh, you didn't want to see them getting knocked around either. It was part of the Northy ethos, wasn't it, that that sort of care among the playing group for one another? Well, that, that playing group was a very good playing group in that they were all out and to look after each other across the board. So it was part of the reason why we, we had such a successful team at that stage was because everyone had each other's backs. You played alongside uh, the great uh, Jimmy Steins uh, to form the competition's most uh, fearsome ruck combo. How do you think that dynamic worked between you two? Because you both relished playing the number one role. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> Jimmy and I had a very uh, fierce competitive uh, streak, both of us. And we, you know, we started playing 19s together. Um, I won the BNF and Jimmy came runner-up in the under-19s, and from then on it was very much a competition for who was going to get the number one spot. Um, training was always full of one-on-one -on -one sessions where you're you know, trying to prove yourself. Uh, but once once we were playing, it was absolutely the, you know, sometimes you got put in positions that, you know, I can remember playing centre forward up in up in Queensland one time. Never played centre forward in my life, but that was where Northy had decided that you know I'd be best suited for the day, and you just do what's best for the team. Uh, tell us a bit about Jimmy the person. Um, were the two of you close, and did you keep in contact um, after the footy had ended? Uh, well, I mean, Jimmy's obviously. Uh, a very well respected and you know, he's done a lot for not only the footy club but also the Reach Foundation. Yep. Um, very, very well respected and you know, an honor honourable person. Um, in regard to keeping up, we didn't uh, really keep up from a day to day basis. But I can remember taking my daughter down to the St Kilda Sea Bars and just sitting by the edge of the pool while his kids and my daughter were swimming in the pool and talking about life after footy and what's really important and really your family and your, your friends and you know your loved ones are probably the most important thing in your life and then the, the footy club kind of was after that so um he's, he's a true gentleman and uh very big loss yeah, certainly. Um, Straubs, there's pretty fierce debate in online chat forums such as ours at demonland.com about playing two ruckmen. Uh, in Melbourne's case, uh, Braden Proust uh, providing some backup for Max Gorn. Is there still a place for two ruckmen in the modern game? There, There is a place for two ruckmen. Uh, a lot depends on the team that you're playing and also what kind of strengths you've got in your forward line and whether you're going to rest your ruckman on the uh, on the bench, what the weather's like, <laughs> whether it's a wet day, dry day. Um, so there's definitely room for two ruckmen and it also depends on the style of play of the ruckman. I mean, these days they're more, more like uh, mobile midfielders uh, than, you know, the old day um, tap out and drop back in a hole type situation. So, I mean, um, there's a lot of factors that have got to be considered against your opponents and then also all the other factors that come into it. But I do think that there's room for two ruckmen in a, in a side these days. Uh, how, do you th how do you think you'd go um, today, Straubs? Would you still get a kick? 
<laughs> that's all, uh, yeah, very hard to say. But the, the way that the kids are developed these days and brought up into the game is obviously different to how you know, would have been developed back in back in our day. Um, so I guess when you when your development uh, is done differently, that you're going to play a different style of game as well. So, I mean, yeah, it did cover a lot of a lot of uh, kilometres over a game back in those days. If, if you were the only ruckman, you'd be on all day. You didn't come off, and you'd be going from you know centre forward or the forward line right back into the defence when they're having shot for goal and covering all the boundaries. So. Um, I don't think fitness would have been an issue, but uh, the style of game is such that it's so intense and uh, you know, that you don't have uh, room to hide anywhere, that's for sure, these days. But um, I don't know. You'd, you'd give it a crack and you'd give it your best and see how you went. I, I noticed that you went uh, to Darwin with a few ex-Demon uh, players to watch the boys the other week. How often do you guys catch up, and is there still a strong bond between all of you? Uh, you achieve some incredible things together. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, how often do we catch up? We probably catch up, uh, well, past players have probably three or four functions a year uh, at the MCG. Um, we also have an annual event, uh, one that's kind of an informal event, and then You've got the formal uh, catch-up before the grand final. Other players, you'll, you'll, you know, you have certain players that you see more often, but just through uh, social events and catching up with each other. Um, that one was one of those things that I, I like to try and get to because uh, not only the past players, but the supporters that go along to that are a fantastic bunch of people. And uh, yeah, it's good to do that kind of thing. Um, sorry, what was uh, the rest of the question? I just uh, it was just how often you catch up, which you've answered, and uh, the you know yeah. the bond between you uh, you guys. Um, yeah, it was great to see sort of you know Grinter and uh, and Hopgood and Stephen Powell and and yourself and a few others uh, there. Yeah. Uh, it's good to see you still being involved with the club. Well, <laughs> the likes of Rod Grinter, he he still does a hell of a lot around the club. He's the president of the Past Players Association. He's always working you know, with the supporter groups now and also he does a lot of work with uh, Fight M&D. And, uh, so he's one of the guys that puts in so much work that it's, uh, and gets very little in, in, in return as in recognition. But um, he'd be one that you absolutely uh, tip your hat to. Yeah, well, we'll be, we're actually uh, in a couple of weeks being interviewing him on this podcast, so looking forward to that. <laughs> Very good. The uh, big question about um, suspensions. Yes, and, we've already uh, got that, it. <laughs> that, 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 that all came up in Darwin uh, after a few years uh, on, on, on a Friday night. Yes, so. he, he, <laughs> he, you ranked uh, ninth in most suspended games for the Ds yeah. and he's number one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> By a long way. I knew, I knew that for a fact. <laughs> uh, Strahd, two final questions for you. You mentioned your children before. Can we expect any uh, O'Dwyer offspring um, to be either on the men's or the women's list any time soon? Well, I've got a daughter. She's 13. She just uh, said to me, oh, Dad, I might take up footy next year. She's been attending the father-son-daughter clinics that Melbourne's running at the moment. Yep. So she's been to uh, one of those. Got another one coming up. In the school holidays, so that's a good, a good program that Melbourne's put in place to try and foster that, um, you know, development of past players, offspring, children, to, um, you know, create an interest in not only football, but the footy club itself. Yep. So you never know. We'll see what happens. Uh, and, and just one last one for you. How often do you get to see the current team play and uh, uh, what do we need to do to turn things around, do you think? 
Uh, <laughs> it's a loaded one. <laughs> how, how, how often? Uh, not often enough. Uh, because my daughter plays uh, sport on Saturday and rep sport on Sunday, it, it's sometimes very difficult to cover all those bases and get to the footy. Um, been to a few games this year, but as I said, probably like to get to a few more. Um, in regard to the current team, I think they've... I mean, they've got the basis there. It's like, competitive enough at the ball. The delivery has been absolutely horrendous um, over the first half of the year. And I think if they can work on that, there's periods of time where they, you know, they might play half a quarter where they can actually put it together and deliver the ball to each other. And then it all seems to fly out the window. Yeah. I think... Uh, that's probably their main thing that they need to get back in line. It seems like, you know, rather than having one or two out of form at once, we seem to have you know, half the team out of form at the same time. And we've got, you know, some injury problems, but you can't put it down to that. Um, so hopefully we get, you know, some more people back in the team. I think also having injuries early in the season doesn't lead to a great preparation for the whole team. Um, so that might have had something to do with it. Um, hopefully they can you know, string together some decent uh, movement into the forward line, well, really across the whole ground, um, and you know, start stringing it together like that and get back to where they were at the end of last year. Hopefully 2020 will be uh, a very different story. Yes, we we hope so too. Uh, Straubs, uh, we just want to thank you uh, for your time uh, tonight. We really uh, appreciate it. And um, it was really nice uh, taking a trip down uh, memory lane uh, with you. So thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me.